Whenever you're ready, man. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 74 of the mini PC show, Big Talk, Small Computers, and my best friend on the planet, Door to Door Geek. How are you, sir? Hey, Rich. I'm doing okay. Uh, I will, as very typical, apologize for the delay in getting the shows out. I will say if you would like to be the one that pesters me, just uh, set a uh, weekly reminder up uh, around Thursday or Friday of every week to send me an email and say publish the show Um, because I seem to need help doing that. Yeah, I'll have to set that up because I I know on occasion I followed up with you and uh, I kind of, you know, spur you on. Uh, But of course, as usual, life gets in the way and changes your priorities. Well, and I'll ask you, how is uh, life going in the great white north? Oh, boy. So I am at the Hughes Outpost Midwest Command, and uh, it was hovering around freezing. And what that meant is my car was iced over. So the doors were frozen, you know, in the stupid, you know, back in the 70s, you actually had a handle you could pull like a mother on. And now you have like this little flappy thingy that if you pull too hard, it'd probably break off. Um. But yes, I did get in the car without too much trouble and scraped the windshields and drove to work. I I was hoping I was going to be past that. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Wasn't there at least a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero sale up in your area? Uh, You you mean on Pi Day where there were $3.14? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 314 ain't too bad. Yeah, I missed that. I I wasn't in the neighborhood. uh, Because I'm, you know, like, I don't know if it's 70 miles away from the nearest, um, what, what is it? Micro center. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say to me, the only April fool's joke that I fell for at least for a second or two, I'm not going to say I fell for it, but at least for like three seconds, I fell for it was a video that I have no, uh, show notes to a ETA prime video is the guy's name ETA prime. And he did a fake video on the raspberry Pi zero plus uh which of course was the raspberry pi plus that we all want oh okay yeah that's the one i sent you so it was supposed to be a pi zero w with like quad core giga ram all sorts of things like that yeah basically everything that we would love to have on a pi zero and we would probably pay twice as much for maybe Mm -hmm. Uh, but of course there's no news so well, I'm kind of head scratching here, and I, I don't have the prices up because I wasn't prepared to talk about this at this time. But um, as much love as I give the Rock 64, you can get is it the two gig version for 25 bucks? Uh, it is cheaper. I will say that. Uh, let me take a quick peek here. If I go to www.pine64, which I did learn, you do not go to pine six, uh, rock64.com. That has nothing to do with the board itself. It's some company selling uh, uh, other stuff. But if we go take a look, it starts out at twenty four ninety five. That's for the one gig version. Um, for the two gig version, I believe it's thirty four dollars. Uh yeah, thirty four ninety five US dollars for the two gig version, twenty four ninety five for the one gig version, and forty four ninety five for the four gig version. All right, so the two gig version typically you get a Pi three B plus for thirty five bucks, right? Yes, sir. So there, and, and let's just do this hardware wise, and and this will dovetail into you know personal experience that I want to talk about. Um. I'm going to talk about, and, and I've been wanting to do this, I, and maybe I'll get the Phronix test out, but un, unfortunately I don't have them at this time. Uh, I wanted to really compare the Odroid XU4 to the Rock 64 and to the Raspberry Pi 3. We, just, just to cut to the chase, the Raspberry Pi 3 is going to be the weakest of the bunch. Um, I, based on specs and you know a little bit of gut instinct, I would have thought the Rock 64 would have been significant, or at least as good as the Odroid XU4 and maybe better, or very likely better, I should say. Well, I'll give a caveat. Should be yes, but I'm almost willing to believe, based upon software 
fitness, if you will, mm -hmm. that the Raspberry Pi 3 would actually do better than expected. And I hate to say it, but since the Rock 64 is new and the, will not have the community support of the Raspberry Pi 4 or uh, 3, will not do as good as you expect, but I still think they would line up exactly as you expect with what you expect in first, what you expect in second, and what you expect in third. Okay. Um, I'm not going to brutally go into hardware. Uh, just comparing the, the rock 64 has one USB three port. The Odroid XU four has two. Uh, they both have the EMMC, which is super nice. I'll tell you what I've been finding is I, I don't know what version I had of uh, Diet Pie on my Rock 64, but I just upgraded to the latest version. So whatever the latest version as of April 4th, which is when we're recording, it's better with Plex, but a couple of issues with that. If I didn't have a heatsink on it, it would be in the dangerous red range where it would be doing damage to the CPU. I threw a heat sink on it and it was still occasionally touching the bottom of the, you know, dangerous red range. I now have a fan and a heat sink on it and it just gets occasionally when it's a single stream on Plex, it will touch the range of elevated temperature. You no, know, just so it's warm, but okay. And, so I was a little surprised about the heat dissipation. So the Odroid comes in two versions. I don't recommend getting the passive version, which is just a big heat sink. Definitely get the version with the fan if you get the Odroid XU4. Um, the Odroid XU4 has no problem because at the Hughes Compound Southern Command, I have the uh, XU4 doing Plex and a number of other things, radar, sonar, transmission, and time capsule. And... It will deliver multiple streams without stuttering. And I, again, unfortunately, I'm not giving you the specs on it. I'm not, I don't know if they're both 1080p streams, but it's definitely in, it very likely are. Um, but it, it's definitely pushing out two streams simultaneously with no problem. I have not had that experience with the Pine 64, and I'm a little depressed about that. You know, I shouldn't say depressed because that, that implies something real. Um, uh, disappointed. And as much as I love Diet Pie, I'm thinking maybe Diet Pie isn't the right OS for this. Well, I mean, well, A, uh, a uh, the passive heatsink on the Odroid XU4, at least from a Maradroid, has a part number of uh, XU4Q, Q for quiet, uh, $61.95. And then the Odroid XU4 with the fan on it, $61.95. The only time I ever would suggest the Q version without the fan on is when you absolutely 100% insist that whatever you're doing has to be 100% quiet. And if that's the case, I would really hope that you're not pushing the limits of the processor in the system. For all other use cases, get the fan, get over the fan. It's not a loud fan. It's actually a very quiet fan. But um, I hate to say, but I'm in the camp. Diet Pie is the multi-tool. It's the all-in-one tool, which to me says it's not going to be at the pinnacle for n almost nearly anything, but it's a great all-in-one tool when you just want to, you know, in air quotes, get something done. And as far as um, Plex, I do not believe I still have heard of a true optimized Plex server operating system for a mini computer, except for like Razplex. Uh, but I question how much optimization has actually been done over and above and beyond just installing the um, Plex server software. Um, but I do believe that you're hitting the edge of where the better the drivers are for the hardware, the much more performance you will see out of the Odroid. I would be really tempted to ask you to try the hard, the official hard, uh, hard kernel 
um, Debian or Ubuntu and see how that would perform. I would really hope you would see at least a moderately significant difference. Yeah, and I'll say uh, 6195 to me for the Odroid X4, part of what you're paying for is the name of the processor. It's a Samsung processor. I would ask people not to bulk at that price, thinking it's a high price. I actually think it's a, a very fair price. I think the Rock 64 and the Raspberry Pi are very low prices. Right. And, and I agree with you on that. And I have, I, I don't remember if I bought the Odroid X4 or you bought it for me, but. Uh, at that price, what is the total out the door? Because you need a power supply with it, right? It, it's like another five bucks, five six bucks. Uh, if you go to a Maradroid, I believe it was f- uh, power supply for the lowest priced one from them, six dollars ninety five cents, seven bucks. So pushing it up to around seventy bucks. Okay, so you know seventy bucks plus shipping, and that's going to be your total out the door cost. The Odroid XU4, if you, you're looking for something, you know, to do Plex, multiple, multiple streams, that Rockstar, absolute Rockstar, I would buy that in a heartbeat. The uh, Rock64, I'm still on the fence with. I, I want it to work, and I'm probably going to change OSs to see what I can, can do to optimize it and get it to work better. You said doo-doo. Um, I did today finally receive my second power supply and my um uh wi-fi um um dongle for it uh, on my second rock 64 i'm going to download armbian to sd card and i'm going to try to run that um if history is any example which i'm hoping it is the armbian experience on that board is going to be pleasant it it isn't going to be perfect, but I really do expect it to be a really good bang, like one of the best bang for the bucks that you can get because it's you know less than seventy bucks total for the power supply, the Wi Fi dongle, and the board. Yeah, I that that was going to be my next go to is if Diet Pie didn't work, I was going to go to the Armbian, and I don't think the Diet Pie. Wi-Fi drivers work with in, and I'm sorry, Dor, you did buy me the uh, Wi-Fi dongle. Uh, I don't think the the Diet Pie is optimized for that chipset. Well, I think both are true. the ch- The Wi-Fi dongle sold with the Rock 64 does not work on non-official Pine 64 distributions well, but the inverse is also true. If you use their official operating systems from Pine64, it seems like the standard Wi-Fi dongles I use don't work at all or so flaky, they might as well not work. So it's one of those, you know, you're either all in or you're not when it comes to their uh, Wi-Fi dongles. And I will say the Wi-Fi dongle I ordered and the power supply I ordered, I did not buy from Pine64 primarily because of how long it would take to get here because it's literally coming from over the pond. Uh, I ordered them off of e, uh, from Amazon. And the Wi-Fi dongle I ordered literally is called I Love Pi, P-I, dongle, um, which has the same chipset that um, uh, their official dongle has in it. So it should, in my logic, work just as good. So I, I'm looking at their software, and let's see. So there's Rockchip Linux GitHub. There's Rock64 Linux GitHub. So there seems to be a couple of repos. Uh, I haven't drilled down into them to see what's there. Well, and if you download their official version of Etcher, it baked into it is the direct download links to the... Um, um, operating systems. That's the way. That's the way that they say you can be assured and insured that you're getting the absolute newest version of that operating system. Oh yeah, that that Etcher, uh, their 
you know, customized etcher. I was going to say hacked. They're customized etcher rocks. It's really good. And that's multiple operating systems. So that runs, you know, Windows, Linux, PC. Did I say Windows, Linux, PC? Mac. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, and I will say when Etcher first came out, I was not even remotely close to a fan of it because you had to have Flash installed. Um, shortly thereafter, they turned their download into, at least on Linux, into a app image with Flash inside of it, which is more secure than having that Flash installed on the base computer. Uh, but then since then, I do believe they've changed their code to where uh, no longer is Flash re, um, re um, acquired for their tool. Once they did that, then I support the tool. Oh, cool. Yeah, you know what? Th- I'm always glad to talk to you about this because you're you're one of the few people I can talk to. So I think uh, I'm probably going to fire up the Etcher, see what's available, and flash something and, and try it out. Yeah, I'm going to uh, try to flash this to an SD card tonight. Uh, literally take it to uh, work tomorrow, have it be my work computer see how well that can work um i truly expect the worst part of my experience is going to be my wi-fi speed it seems like whenever i wirelessly connect to my tethered phone to my phone doing tethering the wi-fi speeds i get are quite quite low um the um uh link to my wi-fi dongle will be in the notes it's called love rpi 2.4 2.4 gigahertz, 150 megabyte Wi-Fi nano dongle, 802.11n for Raspberry Pi and Windows IoT devices, $7.99. Um, it's hard to beat $7.99, just saying. Yep, they're not hurting you. So do you want to read mail? Oh, uh, sure. Which one do you want to go after first? Well, in my mind, Robert Neal comes first. So the subject is, because this kind of dovetails with what we're talking about, best low-powered or small device for Plex server. And and so now I'm going to bust on you, Robert, because I do know you. Um, He says he's a year behind in the show, but loves hearing us guys. So we're going to have to email him back. So the message is, I'm a year or so behind on the show, but love hearing you guys talk about all these great devices that are out there. I have some people asking me about running Plex server. I have a Synology NAS running Plex and hate it. Wow, that, I didn't know it was bad. I have good luck connecting to my files as a NAS mount, but with Kodi on a Pi 2, Pi 3 without Plex. Do you have something you'd recommend for running a Plex server, Odroid, BeagleBoard, or Nook with minimum preferred specs, etc.? I think a common list of boards and mini PCs like fill in the blank with a couple of pros and cons would be awesome to see on the page, maybe even previous favorites styled with strike through font. Aha. Okay. Um, so I was running, actually that, that was another gift from you door, the, uh, Banana Pi M3, which I was running Plex, etc. on, and that seemed to work good. But again, that was OS finicky. I forgot which which OS worked. I think it was a unsupported distro of Diet Pi that I had running, and because there was another distro I was running, and it was hot. And, and I may have this wrong, and I know I've talked about it in, on shows in the past. So if there's a good index, uh, if you look up, you know, Banana Pi M3, you'll find it. So I don't know what the Banana Pi M3 costs right now, um, but that would probably be... Let, let me roll that back. If I get the Rock 64 running, that would be my lowest power choice for the Plex server. And I'm sure the right combination will work on the Rock 64. After that, my next choice would be the M3, and I don't know what the price is. And in my mind, uh, the top of the line, as in non-Intel, would be... Uh, the Odroid XU4. Yeah, so right now the M3 is not easy to get. It wasn't a popular uh, mini computer. Right now on Newegg, one hundred and nine dollars. Ow! Yeah, right now on Cross Ali, it off the list. Yeah, right now on AliExpress, seventy bucks. Um, 
I do think you're right. It was a, like a developer version of diet pie where it worked on it, but that was it. Um, I'll retort his question with a question and say, it depends. Um, how many clients will be connecting to the Pi to the uh, Plex server? That to me seems to be the most influential part of the decision pro process. If it's two people or less, it doesn't matter. Anything will work. Literally, a Raspberry Pi 3 would work just fine. Once you get above two people or both people are doing extremely high uh, bit, bit rate video, that's when we start to have to change the game up. Um, the Odroid XU4, just because of the Samsung processor and moderate, and moderate RAM, makes me lean more towards that. Again, if this Rock 64 s keeps working as well as it does, uh, hook up an external drive via USB 3 and a uh, gig NIC, and I can see this being the one. Um, if, but if I had to right now say the safest bet for a user that you don't want to support, Robert, I would say a NUC because that is almost a drop in thing. You literally just install it and you walk away and you shouldn't have any issues. If they like to tinker a little bit, I think I'm going to lean with Richard right now and say the Odroid XU4, but I will have to write this in an email because he's not going to hear this for about a year. Uh, unless we put it through some sort of voice to text parser. <laughs> yeah. And I will say, I do like the idea of what he said uh, to have a web page with a fill in the blank, the mini PC you like for X. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things. It sounds like a great idea. I wouldn't hold my breath for it to get done. I, th um, I think the best we would churn out would be a shared uh, Google Plus, uh, Google, I'm sorry, Google Drive uh, spreadsheet. Well, and I think first we would need is we would need help deciding all the different task things to list, like a Plex server, mm -hmm. NAS, you know, yada, yada, because there's well, I, almost I endless. Think I think it would have to be like one sheet for like the Plex and then you give the pluses and minuses and then another sheet for maybe NAS. I mean, like I'm running home automation assistant. I could run that on a Pi Zero W. Oh yeah. Doesn't doesn't matter. I I am running it on a Pi three. Um and let's see, the Pi Aware will run on anything Pi two and better. So yeah, I'm trying to think what else I got. And my retiring crash plan on my Banana Pi Pro, which I, I probably ought to find something else for the Banana Pro to do. Well, although I, I may throw Sync Thing on it. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned it at the show. Sync Thing doesn't have... Oh, I, are we done with this? Because I don't want to move on. Yeah, yeah, good. So Sync Thing I've been pretty happy with. Although it doesn't have a restore UI like Duplicati does. So I may run uh, Duplicati and Sync Thing in parallel for a while. And um, Duplicati is very cool. We, we've talked about it in prior shows. I don't know which episode. But the cool thing about Duplicati is it doesn't care what's on the back end. It could be the Amazon cloud. It could be an NFS server. It could be a Samba share. It could be uh, like a dozen different things. So it's really very universal. So I like it a lot for those reasons. And also it's cross-platform and versioning. So uh, the, the check boxes for what I want to use is it's got to have a GUI. It's got to be cross-platform. It's got to be open source. And what else? I, I think that's it. Cross-platform, open source. Versioning. Versioning, yes. Thank you. That, that's my other requirement. But yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong. The driver behind you wanting a GUI interface is what if you need to do a restore and you're not home? You want to help guide somebody through the process, correct? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, and the idea of not having a GUI and having to guide somebody through that process cannot be easy. Yeah, that that would probably be I uh
use team viewer to go in and you know basically run their machine to bring it through the restore process gotcha gotcha um yeah what i'm tempted to do rich is we can uh well first i haven't gotten any email feedback on my hdmi capture thing yet so i'm looking forward to getting some responses to that but if we can figure out a way to for anybody to add to a list of topics for mini computers like nas plex server kind of thing we can't say google plus group because there's plenty of people out there who will not use google uh so we have to f- kind of figure out another mechanism to do that i mean if you want to i say people just send in emails at mini pc show at panas.com of all the different kinds of topics for a mini computer to be good or bad at Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. I well, we do have the Mattermost server. I don't know how much traffic you've been getting there. Completely random is what I'll say. Mm-hmm. And if you want to be on the Mattermost server, it's a non Google index, non Facebook snooping uh, ser- uh, server that we host on DigitalOcean, where we own the keys to it. And if you want private uh, chats, that's the uh, best place, in my opinion, to go. Uh, if you want to chat with people on Podnuts. And if you want to get on that, just shoot me an email, mail at podnuts.com. I can send you an invite via email. Okay. Um, next email is a quickie. It's from uh, Tom. Uh, Tom basically says, um, uh, hey, hey, Dor, I think you said you run own cloud or next cloud on one of your single board computers, something better than a Raspberry Pi, and you have a great Back, backup battery that charges until there is a loss of power. Please send me details on that setup. Which single board computer, which backup battery? Keep up the great work. Thanks, Tom. I will send them to you an email, Tom, but here's the thing. That's what is... Um, this is what I, I set up on in the past when I when you know it was all that was available and it was the best it was available if i had to rebuild everything today it probably wouldn't be on identical hardware with that said it still runs fine it still runs perfectly fine um i'm running um the os on um bananian not raspbian not diapi on an operating system called bananian on which my... has had no updates in like three years yes it's been unbelievably anemic as far as updates and I'm sure security updates. And yes, this is a public facing IP address server. Um, but it's running on my banana pie pro, which is still probably too expensive for what it is. I want to say it's around 70 ish dollars for the banana pie pro with a three year old processor in it, but it has a, a genuine SATA two port, which is the reason why I got it. it. Oh, it's not gig ethernet. Is it? No, 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 not gig Ethernet. Um, it does have a gig of RAM, and it does have. And right now, uh, it has a 240 gig, 2.5 SSD connected to it. Um, I picked that small of a form factor, expecting it would need less power because the power is also connected through the Banana Pi Pro. And the battery backup is a very specific Rav Power battery which uh, nowhere on the Amazon listing does it state it has um, uh, uninterrupted power on it. For some reason, they do not mention it, but it, it, it is. Uh, they actually called it something weird on their specs. They call it uh, MCU. Uh, whatever MCU stands for, I have no idea. Uh, it says MCU control and stabilize current output enable up to 2.1 amp slash 2.4 amp consistent current output during charging or 4.5 total current output. So when the battery uh, gets kicked on because of the power is out, it can only output on one of those ports. Uh, and it, that's what I have. So basically it's a single use emergency battery backup and constant power source for my banana pie pro. Uh, right now on Amazon, it is $31 and 99 cents. Yeah. Occasionally it goes on sale. Uh, but 
definitely that if you want a UPS for your device for your Pi device, that's that's definitely the best thing out there. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not going to try to say it's the best portable battery you can get. I'm sure there are better. I'm sure there are ones that have higher milliamp hours and that are smaller, better form factor. But I can tell you, for an uninterruptible power supply, I've not been able to find anything remotely close in price or per or per uh, performance anywhere. Uh, I literally bought a second one just to have in case, just because, and I'm not sorry that I bought it. And if you crack it open, there's just 16850 lithium batteries in there. Well, or is 18, it 18650? Yeah, 18, 18650. And if you even go down on the page, uh, scroll down, you can even see they even show you it opened up and, they're, and they show you the batteries inside of it. They, you know, everything in the world that is w- worth anything seems to be powered by these very same batteries. And they're the same battery in a Tesla. And almost every laptop and, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, Were there any other links in the notes you wanted to uh, go after, Rich? Hmm, going back to the notes. Oh, well, yeah, I I guess your link, 634. Oh, Chip, okay. Your buddy okay. Chip. Yeah, and and I'll first and foremost say I really do like my Chip computer. I do not use it close to as much as I should. Uh, I have the Pocket Chip. It, it's a little bit cumbersome to use, so I don't really use it. Uh, it's a I don't want to say a, a novelty to have, but it's definitely cool to have. Um, people are reading the tea leaves, and what it seems like is that there was a process called a uh, a uh, assignment to the benefit of creditors has been done, which is a alternative, which is a alternative to bankruptcy. Uh, and it appears like Chip has possibly done that, and it looks like this might be the beginning of the end of the Chip, um, which is actually uh, by the company Next Thing. Um, I, I will say if history is an example, this, this isn't the end of them. They started doing other things. They're going to move on to do other things, but I'm sure it's going to be around doing these kinds of uh, small boards, small chips. Um, I really wish this company would have got more traction, more success, but I guess it wasn't meant to be. Yeah, it's kind of a cool maker geek style type thing. And, and of course, yeah, it's it's disappointing. You, you wish it got more traction because it looked like if they continued on that line, they'd have some fun stuff in the future. Yeah, and with that said, um, the main developers, the main brains behind this are going to come out with other stuff. They're going to come out with cool stuff. The guys behind this, I truly believe, had their heads on right. Um, they either struck at the wrong time or, you know, one of those weird things. They just picked it to be the wrong color or something weird. They did not see the success, in my in my opinion, that they should have saw. But um, I'm also sure this is just going to give them another opportunity to do something else and hopefully uh, have some success. Okie doke. Uh, if you let me pick again, I'm going to say 632. And that's the NVIDIA GPU. So, let's see. The, the title of the article is NVIDIA Deep Learning Accelerator IP to be integrated into ARM Project Trillium platform easing building of deep learning IoT chips. I'm not sure what all that means. Uh, but basically it's looking to me like NVIDIA is doing work with ARM, uh, and I'm kind of dovetailing that into some recent news where Apple is talking about moving away from Intel as far as their laptops and desktops go. Yeah. 
I'll say I did listen to an interview maybe a week ago with the NVIDIA, I believe, chairman. Um, the long and the short of what this whole conversation is, is NVIDIA is not banking on cryptocurrency, crypto mining being their sole future. Because a lot of people right now believe, right, if, if, if NVIDIA wants to make a lot of money, they will do everything to capitalize on everything cryptocurrency. Uh, they're not. They uh, are, they to me are taking a more agile uh, stance and they want to be more on the small, low power IoT and then the inverse, the high, deep learning ships um, realm of the market. Um, and yes, um, we basically called it uh, maybe a month ago. Uh, the, um, you know, it was in the tea leaves that it's going to be inevitable that Mac will once again leave the Intel brand of processors behind and they will be on their own. Um, and, and, and saying their own chips is almost not completely accurate. They're going to be on their own designed uh, ARM chips on all their devices here before too long, it seems like, which, to be honest, as a business is a very smart move on their behalf. But if I was Intel again, I've said this for multiple weeks in a row, if I was Intel, uh, that's not good news. That's very bad news. Yes. Yeah. I And I've, I've kind of gone through the Hackintosh phase, so I kind of got it out of my system. I was thinking about revisiting it, but I don't think I'm going to go there again. I, I It was a massive time burner and uh, better off just going Ubuntu. Yeah, I, every time I think Hackintosh, what goes through my head is like the old uh, vaudeville type act where the guy would have a bunch of plates on sticks and yes. he would have to keep bouncing around, spinning them. And it's only because everything keeps changing, mm -hmm. uh, updates keep coming down, and it's going to end up breaking things. So you have to spend your time getting things back up and running again. Um, Dude, were you spying on me? <laughs> no, it just seems like it. Hey, well, and here's the real reason why Apple should go to their own chips, because then they can control the cost even more and have more of a profit um, margin on each device. They don't get to say how much they're going to spend on each Intel Intel uh, processor. And if you take a look at their last couple generations of devices, they don't seem to like to put the newest of the newest processor in their yes. devices. And my logic is, is because they don't want to pay that price. Well, I, I think a couple of things. Uh, one of the things that's always been true with Apple, there, there was a brief period of time where they did have other hardware manufacturers, you know, third party clones out there. But they, I don't know how many years that lasted, but they pulled that back. They slammed that door shut. The good thing about the Apple operating system and their hardware is it's one operating system and one hardware. They're in complete control of both. Whereas somebody like Microsoft is not in control over the hardware. They have to support many different keyboards, many different mice, many different trackpads, many different you know, whatever input device, display device, drive type device, accessories, etc. So it's much harder for Windows to build an operating system that works on n number of thousand different combinations of hardware out there, as opposed to Mac uh, with their OS, you know, their phone runs on one piece of hardware and, you know, several versions thereof. Likewise, they're, you know, whether it's a laptop or desktop, uh, they're not running on a vast number of different pieces of hardware, so they can very much optimize what they're doing on that hardware, which I, I think is a really good paradigm, but again, it, there's zero competition for the hardware, so typically the way I always say it is the Mac hardware costs twice as much as what it should for um like a Mac laptop with a certain amount of RAM, certain CPU, certain hard drive, costs twice as much as what a Windows machine would be, or that Windows machine when you put Ubuntu on it. Yeah, and I mean, it's all about perspective. And what I mean by that is, 
if I was an Apple shareholder or was working in that big office, I would say, no, I think they're perfectly reasonably priced. Uh, being a consumer of goods, they're extravagantly priced. I think part of the reason they're priced so high is so after someone buys them, they can turn to somebody and, hey, and, you know, and like they can say, hey, look what I have. Um, I'm pretty sure if Apple could release a $3,000 iPhone with a picture of Beyonce on the back, they would. Uh, but, uh, you know, they haven't yet kind of thing. Um, they'll they'll do anything for profit. Uh, and that's what capitalism is all about. Well, now here's here's the other thing is I, I don't know that I'm the most expensive consultant in the world, but I want to be one day. And, you know, it's kind of like wearing an Armani suit. If if you walk in with, you know, the top end MacBook Pro, they're like, well, you know, this guy, you know, he it's it's flashy and people know what it is and they know how much it costs. It's kind of yeah. like being in Palm Beach and having the brand new Lamborghini. Well, and, and to be honest, I personally believe that's at least 80% of the Teslas that have been sold, they were sold for that reason. So somebody could say to their brother-in-law who or whoever, look at my Tesla. Uh, look, I, I said that to my friend, a uh, high school classmate, and you know he's posting pictures of the two Teslas he owns. I'm like, dude, I didn't know you had Tesla money. I got to treat you nicer. Yes. Um, now, I want to change the topic here, Rich. Um, mine is now uh, line 634 again. Um, okay. Long, blubbering story cut very short. Stephen Hawkins. Okay. No matter what you think of him, um, the one thing that I think everybody should be able to agree on is if this guy was born in a different era, AKA 50 years ago, 200 years ago or whatever, he would have been cast off in the corner of a room to die because medicine could not have helped him. I don't want to say he was born at just the right time because it, seems like it but of course it's not true he was born at such a time when computers were evolving and computers literally assisted this guy's life more than maybe anybody's life in the public eye uh but here's the real kicker um his famous voice that played on his wheelchair uh for at least the last couple years uh, was actually being driven by a Raspberry Pi. Um, I'll say uh, out loud, not a lot of people knew that. Oh, I had no idea. Uh, yeah, he didn't advertise it, partially because he didn't advertise much about his technology whatsoever. Um, he was a very impatient guy. He had this, and he had the software turned up to where he, he would actually make a lot of mistakes, but the software would always fix it for him kind of thing. Uh, right now, there is uh, a uh, developer who was one of the people on the team working on the software who's trying to save that voice um, because we always dream about, you know, like what would Abraham Lincoln sound like if we were to hear him today? What would George Washington sound like? What would whoever sound like? Well, the future people have the honest to goodness chance to hear exactly how Stephen Hawkins sounded to all of us for the foreseeable future forever. If they are able to get this software, uh, and actually, you know, save the guy's voice. Cause the first voice that was done was actually a American's voice basically dubbed back onto the computer and then digitized. Uh, Hawkins said the only bad thing about the voice was it made him sound like he had a, a, uh, a, uh, um, American accent, but he stuck with it. And that became to all of us to be known as the voice of Stephen Hawkins. Um, uh, this is the kind of thing I, I really hope it gets done. I really hope it gets done right. I really hope they're able to save the voice because of right now I believe the voice is not in a open license. I do believe the back end software driving the voice is open software, but not the voice itself. And they're trying right now to see if they can get it open. Um, 
if it does happen, I think it will be very cool. I think it will lead to uh, at least good like documentary type things talking about the life and times of Stephen Hawking's because here's the thing. Of all the things that he did scientifically, 80% of what he did, we as human beings are going to be talking about and discussing about and arguing about if he was right or not for probably the next 80 to 100 years. Uh, I don't know if people today realize how much of an impact he's had on science itself, but you know, it's one of those things time will tell his story. There, there's a number of interesting things about Stephen Hawking's. Uh, one, I adore you're nearly my age, uh, but back, you know, 1983, that, that time frame, not too many people knew who he was. And it was only us uber geeks that actually did know who he was. And so it was kind of, you know, my daughter, who's 16 now, knows who he is and she doesn't know anything about science. But it, it was kind of cool because he, he did a couple of uh, cameo appearances. He was on Star Trek uh, Next Generation. He was in Big Bang Theory. So it was kind of fun that he was integrated into you know the popular culture. Uh, and again, however popular Next Generation and Big Bang Theory is. Although Big Bang was like number one for a very long time, right? Yep. And he was also in The uh, Simpsons when it was at its peak. Uh huh. Now, the voice was an American, and they offered to change it for him. But out of respect for the guy who developed the system for him, he said, "No, that's my voice," which I thought was kind of cool. The other thing that's interesting, I, I think there's—I uh, don't know if there's a movie or a television show about him or a special. Apparently, he. The way the show, if I recall it correctly, portrayed him was a bit of a partier and really didn't care about studies, and which I, I hate to say it this way, and I don't mean this with any malice, but if it wasn't for his condition, he may not have been the great thinker that we all know, because yeah. he may have been quite a different individual personality-wise. The, the, the last thing I heard recently about him was that his he would do all of these very sophisticated papers in no time whatsoever where it would floor his, uh, I, I think it was doormate, that he would be able to write up these papers for his class assignments and they'd be brilliant, and he would think nothing of it. And so it, obviously, naturally, very naturally talented guy in, in the field. And, you know, just at the time didn't have any respect for his talent. Yeah. And, and I do believe he said back in like the late eighties that if, uh, he didn't have the condition he had, he would not have spent as much time pondering the great many things. And a lot of his theories probably would not have came to, um, fruition. So dare I say, Living a life in isolation and silence and deep thought was the side effect of a disease where he could have basically just went to a corner and voluntarily just gave up and died. But instead, he pondered uh, the great beyond, the you know uh, everything out in space. And I will say, um, literally today, yesterday, two days ago, whatever. Uh, scientists um, announced that they now believe that there is not a single black hole in the center of our galaxy, but possibly hundreds of black holes uh, in the middle of our galaxy. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I, you know, kind of wish I didn't hear about because that's, uh, I don't know, scary, creepy, not good. I, I don't know that's going to have any effect on my life. Well, I don't know if it will, it will, will either, but at the same time, if it is, it's been there all along and we're fine, but just knowing it is the kind of thing, hmm. but the great vastness of our galaxy means that there could be a billion different things going on and we would never have it affect our lives. But, you know, how do we know that we haven't already crossed the event horizon into a black hole and we're just experiencing the time dilation right at that edge? Yeah, or like Tesla, 
Right. And I don't, and people say like Tesla, screw him. I thought of this when I was like 10 years old. Um, how do we know that we're not in a simulation? Nothing is real. And this is all just code running and our consciousness that which we still can't define what consciousness is, is nothing more than a blip on a immaculate processor, you know, who knows? I don't know, but I always say, if you wake up in the morning and you feel refreshed and you get out of bed and there's no pain and you get ready for work and everything goes right, then you go to work and there's no traffic and no one's driving like a, like a absolute jerk and you get to work and everything's working and everything goes your way. Wake up cause it's all a dream. <laughs> or you're dead. I didn't know where you're going with that. Right. Or you're dead and it's all a dream, you know? Yeah. It's one of the things. Um, Because I was counting how few of those I checked off as correct. Yeah, exactly. And without sounding stupid, that's why every day when something goes wrong, I just, hmm, okay, this is life. I, I couldn't tell you how many times. It, it just became a freaky situation that my daughter and I would be driving together and I would get all green lights. Like, are we going to get it? You know, and yes, got the, like all the way home. We had green lights several times. So that, that became like the challenge. Yeah. And I will say, um, Hawkins was on television shows, um, back into the seventies, at least I do remember seeing a couple shows with him and, um, oh man, there were a couple people on the show besides Richard Feynman. I want to say it was, uh, Stephen Hawkins and, um, Cosmos. I can't believe I can't oh, yeah. think of his name. Um, where um, they were purposely pacing the discussion in order to give Stephen Hawking's time to type out his answer. So I'll say he was on television back then, but it wasn't as hip to be uh, someone in his predicament talking about what he was talking about back then. I personally believe, and it's one of those hindsight's twenty twenty kind of thing. Um, uh, Carl. Um, Carl, Carl Sagan. Yeah, Carl almost made it. Uh, and honestly, thanks to Johnny Carson, Carl Sagan made it okay to be an uber nerd. And people like uh, Hawkins and people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, Bill Nye, all of them are riding the wave of Carl Sagan. Um, because of him, I believe people like Steve Hawkins could get on stage and could give a you know, uh, speech on black holes and actually have people in the audience who that wasn't their life work, but they could still enjoy it. Good point. So did Stephen Hawking ever do an episode of Doctor Who? Um, I would be shocked if he didn't, now that you say that out loud. I mean, it's filmed in the UK. Right. Hmm. I guarantee you he was at least mentioned. I mean, he had to be mentioned, but he, 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 I'll say this. He should have been an episode of Doctor Who. Oh, and I, I know I had one more thought. I just finished watching Altered Carbon on Netflix. So if, if that technology was available, uh, hmm. Anyhow. Yeah, that, that's one that I've had multiple people tell me how I have to watch. Um, I already got the gist of it from people. Um, basically, mind and body are separated. Bodies become sacks that body that... Um, sleeves. Yeah, sleeves that brains get dumped into. So don't judge a book by its cover kind of thing. Correct. And I've told I've been told the book is much better. I'm going to see about getting the audio book because I am going to be doing a 19 hour drive shortly, or two 19 hour drives shortly. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, do you have any other things you wanted to uh, talk about here, Rich? Mm, you know what? You got the cursor on line 631. So the, the Hughes Compound Southern Command, I Nick Merritt, who is a listener of Tilts, recommended I get the EasyViz Wired. It's an eight-camera alarm uh, eight camera security system that's wired, and it's like 400 bucks. I got it on Amazon. I just installed that, but I'm thinking I want to put uh, maybe, since I got a couple of Pi Zero Ws, and I ordered the cameras for them, I'm thinking I want to put a couple out by like the mailbox and the gate 
you know, the entrance to the driveway just so I can like maybe get some detection when people are coming and going and the mail is delivered. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, well, I'm not going to say anybody who listens to tilts is wrong. What I will say is if you own a camera system and you don't have root, somebody else does. Oh, absolutely. Um, I do like the idea. I've always, there's only one internet of things, home network thing that ever intrigued me at all. And that is having my own, uh, closed circuit television feed where, you know, my own camera feed. Uh, I've never done it partially because cameras I find like screens to be a little bit pricier than I think they should be is what I'll say. Um, but I will say, um, the camera software, the network monitoring camera software has grown a lot in the last couple of years. Um, uh, can I ask what is, is there a specific camera software that you're looking at? Um, I was thinking about motion for the raspberry Pi. Gotcha. Yeah. That I want to say is one of the newer ones. Um, I have heard at least two people, uh, say that it worked fine is what i'm gonna say it's hard for them to work really good um uh it i think it all depends on all the little things the lighting the shading the contrast is going to determine how good these softwares work uh, i'll tell you what i'll miss uh compared to the commercially boxed uh system oh and so two things about the easy viz one is if i block its internet access i can connect to it you know, directly on my LAN. And the other thing, and that's from uh, Android or iPhone app, I can open it and connect to it over the internet. But it's, if I'm not home, it's better that I, I get better speeds and response if I VPN in and connect direct to it. So while I don't have root, I do have the ability to keep other people from seeing it because I just can, you know, turn off internet access to the device. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, do you know in this software if you can set up, um, I want to call them like hotspots where you can say on this camera, in this corner of the camera, if we see motion, send me an alert. Okay, so there's motion masking and c a couple of good, I, I'll have to give you the link for the device now. A um, couple of cool things. On the app, if you're holding your phone in profile as opposed to landscape, It'll show you the image on the camera that you're looking at, and it'll show you a timeline below, and you can zoom into it. Now, I don't have the motion. Of, it says ift, but I don't know if these cameras are ift compatible. The app on the phone says ift. Um, and yes, there's a, like motion sensing areas and then like motion masking areas, if, if I'm correct, that you can do. I haven't set that up. You need to set that up on the console. It doesn't set up on your phone. You don't have complete control over your phone for that. Um, but I've noticed a couple of things now that, you know, I'm owning the device is like, say I have no vegetation and a camera aimed at the driveway and it's only the driveway in the view of the camera. You still have shadow issues because when the sun's low and you have vegetation moving and it's going to cast shadows. And at night with the IR, which I'm I'm shocked at how good because there's IR LEDs circling the camera. I'm shocked at how good it works. It works excellent uh, and at, at a good distance. The only flaw that I have is just my installation um, that it's getting a little blinded because there's something close that's getting brightly illuminated and you know the iris how it has to you know the f-stop for that adjust that it's exposing for that and not the darker area but if I move the camera a little bit it'll be good but I've actually seen bugs hovering around the IR I guess bugs seeing the IR spectrum and they'll set off the motion sensing Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I'm. I believe this is the kind of thing. No matter what, when you go and set it up, it's going to require tweaking because of yes. the inevitable things that you can't see. No pun intended. That you know everything else can see. So I do think it's the kind of thing you have to be able to set up 
more than a couple days worth of uh, going back and tweaking to get it set up right. And Motion Eye is the operating system, Motion iOS, and it does look like Motion is a back end in uh, structure part of it, and Motion Eye is the front end part of it. Yeah, and if I get all of these talking on my home automation assistant and have a one go to console, that would be fantastic. Yes, and I will say I like the idea of also having a screen dedicated in the house where all it is doing is cycling through all the different cameras. Uh, you know, it, it, it isn't that I want to turn my house into like a, um, uh, you know, combine kind of thing, looking at all the cameras around. But, you know, it's nice to see if there's somebody cutting through your yard, especially when uh, I want to say Saturday morning, I was awoken at. 3.40 in the morning by a guy who I couldn't tell if what nationality he was. Sure in the hell wasn't American, I tell you that. Knocking on my door, asking me, where is the black guy? And oh my we, gosh. I was like, excuse me? I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, drop off, uh, African American. And he said he had to go around the back of this house to get in to pay me my money. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so like an Uber driver dropped off. Oh, some guy that scammed him. Yeah. Well, cause right behind my house, I have no fence. It's a very easy to walk through to other houses behind my house. Literally kids with four wheelers come through the side of my house. It's so heavily traveled. And I just told the guy, look, ain't nobody here except us white folk. You gotta go. You got scammed. He wasn't very happy. But oh hey. man, actually, I'm just looking at the link. I think I paid 400 for this. It's 349 now. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, Rich. I think we hit a good, uh, dare I say, broad spectrum of things. Um, where can people go if they want to uh, catch up with you? Well, flagrich.com, I, I post my videos, social media, it's my social media hub, and you can see the podcast I'm on there, which includes the mini PC, and unfortunately, not in a while have I been on the makers. Well, I will say, uh, going to Florida has not helped that show. Um, a couple of the guys got addicted to Dungeons & Dragons, so now we split, and we do one week of D&D, &D, and then one week of the show. And I believe it's now been over a month since we've done one of those shows. But I think this weekend we're going to get to do another one. Wait, DDG is doing D D and D. I'm trying, but I suck. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their support. Thank everyone for their feedback. Uh, I will type out emails to those guys who uh, sent us. Um, those questions and do not forget if you want to support us, the easiest way is to go to, uh, patreon.com. Uh, there are links in the notes to where, if you want to support us on Patreon, or you can just, uh, uh shoot us a direct email at mini PC show at podnos.com. And with that, hopefully Brian will be back next week and we will talk to everyone real soon.